For more than 40 years, MCC has been committed to its community. In 2006, the community showed its commitment to MCC. The residents of McLennan County overwhelmingly approved a bond package that would fund three new state-of-the-art buildings on MCC's campus. MCC had grown from a college of 5,000 students to 9,000 students with the knowledge that it would probably very quickly move to 10 or 12,000 students and possibly more. And with the advent of the university center programs, it was very clear that more space was going to be needed. The largest of the new buildings went to the sciences. At 102,000 square feet, it offered plenty of room for innovative features. We looked at buildings in several different locations, uh, and the unique features that we were able to pick out from those different visits all contributed to the science building. And so what, what makes the science building here unique is that it incorporates what we feel are many of the very best features of science buildings from pretty much all around the country. But in the middle of a building devoted to science, students find one unexpected feature, art. MCC's new science building was designed as an innovative learning space for students studying the sciences, but administrators also recognized the impact that art could have on the educational experience of MCC students. With that in mind, they approached local philanthropists James and Nell Hawkins, whose contributions to the arts can be found throughout the community. With their generous support, local artist and craftsman Brian Stanton was hired to design and install two structures to adorn the MCC Science Building. Direction for the art piece in the foyer was clear from the start. It would be a stained glass fixture representing all of the sciences. The building's three-story stairwell would prove to be a more challenging canvas. Dr. James Watson, who was one of the original scientists who developed the human genome, was actually on our campus. And so uh, that whole process was fresh on our minds. And I thought about it for a second, and I came to the conclusion that, hey, what if we did a DNA sculpture that would hang in this space? The stairwell was there in the original design of the building. And as we were looking at what features we might put in there, it simply became a very natural way to go. Stanton began designing a structure that would fit the space, but assembling 1,500 pounds of glass, steel, and a dichroic material known for its chameleon-like color qualities would be anything but simple. Lee and I had discussed the installation of the sculpture, the DNA sculpture, and also the lobby piece a hundred times. Because of the confines of the stairwell in which the sculpture went, we knew that it was going to have to be built in, or have to be installed in segments and sections. We installed a winch in the ceiling, and we were just going to pull it straight up and actually build a segment at a time. On the ground, we would assemble it and lift up, you know, put the glass in it, you know, clamp it all in place, level it out, clean it raise it up, bolt the next section on, put the glass in it, clean it, raise it up until it was hung. And it was great. It was working wonderful. Our plan was perfect. And the winch was rated for 3,000 pounds. And you know we had 1,400 pounds approximately of, of sculpture to lift. And as they uh, started lifting it up, uh, it got heavier and heavier. And the winch that they had uh, purchased to lift it uh, failed about a third of the way up. And we can hear the hoist grinding. It was just growling. And everybody looked at each other. It's like, it's not going to lift. Easy! Keep on. Easy! We, we secured the sculpture to hang overnight. Um, came back uh, to my shop that evening, about 12 o'clock in the night. Lee ran down to Austin and uh, came back in the morning, early in the morning, and brought back a chain hoist. We had to do some, some uh, long distance fishing to, to thread the eye bolt that was on the sculpture so that it would accept the hook and straps and things like that that we needed to secure it back to it. And so pulling on that chain, Lee hoisted the 
entire sculpture up there inch by inch by inch. And uh, doing it that way is a lot, definitely a lot more nerve wracking because there's a lot more motion involved with it. So it's at different points, the entire sculpture was, was shifting and swaying. And you know, when you've got a, a 33 foot tall sculpture that's full of glass, moving like it was. Emotionally, I was wrung out. And frankly, I just prayed the whole time. God help them, don't let this thing fall. Uh, we got it all the way up and literally had, I think, about a quarter of an inch difference between the chain fall and the actual shackle. So one of my men climbed up the ladder back up into the attic and took the eye bolt, which had a lot of extra thread on it, and loosened the nut and let out about a quarter of an inch or three quarters of an inch of thread, tightened the bolt back down, and that gave us that quarter of an inch that we needed to put the clevis pin through the sculpture. When we made that and he screwed it back up and, and we finally let everything off of the chain falls and it was on its own to the building. <laughs> I, I could say I was, I was relieved, number one, because at that point I knew it was secure. Um, I was still on a plank about 45 feet up in the air and I think I think Roger, uh, the, one of the lead contractors, was there, and I, I told him that he better be ready to catch me because I think my knees might give out from under me at that point. I remember Lee climbing off the scaffolding with his knees knocking together, and he looked at me and he said, never again, <laughs> never again. I, I literally had to walk away for about 10 to 15 minutes just to kind of gather myself. I remember seeing him bury his face in those massive hands of his, and he sobbed. I'm not sure uh, professional writers or poets could adequately describe the double helix that he has created. I think to put it in words would be very difficult. I, I think it's one of those things you just have to see it to believe it. It is so unique and so impressive and, and uh, it's just wonderful. As you walk around the sculpture, the colors are constantly shifting as now you see it, now you don't. The whole sculpture rotates on a single cable. So you'll go to class and the sculpture will be in one position. You come out of class and it'll be in another position. It, it, it undulates, it's kind of alive. It, it has a life of its own. Different times of day, the light shines in differently in the, in the stairway. And I will tell you that of the limited number of times that I've seen it, you cannot stand in a different location around the double helix or around the uh, stained glass feature and see the same thing. Uh, the prism glass that's in there, you can actually look at it. And with the natural light, you can see a, a, a double helix within the glass itself. And I mean, it was just, just breathtaking. You definitely wanted to impart an organic feel to this because it is to represent DNA. So, you know, we forged the ends out, both top and bottom, so that on one end it looks like it's coming back together and the other end looks like it's starting to unzip and unravel. It's not just the double helix, it's also the piece in the ceiling because it represents all the sciences. And I think that it simply conveys a message to students that this is a very special place. And I think it will give them pause to stop and look at it and think about the, the way the different sciences are represented. And it, I mean, it really is dramatic. Perhaps James and Nell Hawkins, whose generous gift funded the artwork, understood the impact these two sculptures would have on the MCC campus. This visionary couple has long understood the importance of artwork and education. Their gift married the two. When I was 29 years old, we had three projects we identified that Waco really needed in the future. And they were the convention center, the low water dam, and the junior college. And at the time, it was just a vision, a dream. And whoever would have thought we would have been able to do all three of them. And to, to be able to see that from just a vision to where I am now in life, 
and to be able to be a part of it and be able to help finish it and to keep improving it, it means a lot. An artist is given an opportunity, he's given a blank canvas to work off of and what he does with that canvas either makes his career or breaks the career and to have two incredible opportunities like this, two canvases to paint on at such a great school as McLennan Community College uh, has been a privilege and, and an honor. You know, pieces like this are probably not things that you would normally find in a building on a community college campus, but where generous people have been willing to share their resources to provide those kinds of things uh, with the building just make it that much more special. So I think the community can be very proud for providing the, the funding for the basic need of that building and can be very proud that our community has generous people who are willing to add those special touches. I personally do better in a beautiful environment. I think you can, um, you think better, you feel better, and I think that will encourage uh, many students to do a lot more uh, with their creativeness. And I think that, that art makes the difference in this building. I think it's sort of like the icing on the cake. It's just such a, a powerful icon that uh, I can't help but think it's going to impact the students more than anybody else.